غزل خزائل هائے 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 ایروم دی خزالا مالا باکی چوزو زانائے Thank you, Peter and Della, and also thank you, Jamie, for, for that introduction. And I have to say that it's a, an absolute honour to have been invited to speak at this event today because I think, as Jamie says, it is so important. Before I start talking about Kobani, however, I think I should make some mention of the extraordinary events which are happening at this very moment in Iran and mainly, but not exclusively, in Rojalat or the Kurdish sections of Iran, that is Iranian Kurdistan, where we have seen the absolutely inspiring spectacle of young people, mainly led by women and many Kurdish women among them, coming out in the streets and defying the Islamist regime. I won't call it an Islamic regime. It's an Islamist regime. It's, an, it's the an absolute antithesis of everything that we here stand for. And those young people, they came out in the streets and they said, we used to be frightened of them, but now they are frightened of us. And let us hope that this uprising rocks that revolting undemocratic, absolutely closed-minded um, system and brings it down and there is a democratic awakening in that country. There's a very strong Kurdish connection there because it actually started, as you will know, when a young woman who is usually called Ma Masa Amini was killed by the brutal thugs of the regime. In actual fact, her name, the name that she's known by in her family, is Gina, because she's Kurdish. And it sums up a lot of the repression of the Kurdish people throughout the many countries of the Middle East, that she was not allowed, her parents were not allowed to call her by the name that they, would, that they gave her. They had to give her a Persian name instead. And that re re um, rebellion there has the same philosophical roots, if you like, as the amazing defence of Kobani. And the slogan of those young people, those young women in Iran today, of course, is Jin Jihan Azadi. And if we translate that from the Kurdish, it means women, life and freedom. And it's a remarkably um, simple sounding slogan but if you start to unpack it and you think about it, it encapsulates everything that people who value human life, who value equality for all people, freedom for all people, the environment, Mother Earth who gives us, who gives us all life, it sums all, all of those things up. And few people know the origin of that battle cry, and that's what it is. It's a battle cry for freedom. It comes from the Kurds and it was used by the Kurdish defenders of Kobani. Back in October 2014, of course, Islam, the Islamic State, or I'll call it Daesh from now on, because that's the name that it deserves and that's the name that it hates, it was cutting through the countries of the Middle East like a knife, the proverbial knife through butter. Um, they made a lightning fast advance towards um, towards Kobani. Um, 400,000 refugees left the neighbourhood, the region of Kobani. They fled. And 
it's an enormous sum of people and you can't really get your mind around it and you can get numbed by statistics. But one thing that always sticks in my mind was one person who was one of those refugees was a little boy called Alan Curdy. He came from Kobani. His parents were taking him across the seas, across the mountains to safety in Europe and he died. He drowned in the sea. And I'm a father myself and it breaks my heart to think of that little boy drowning. And then you multiply that tragedy 400,000 times, millions of times, and we begin to get some sort of inkling of the suffering from that Daesh advance through Iraq and Syria. Um, why were those people fleeing? They were fleeing a medievalist, brutal dictatorship. The, the leader of that organisation, a man called um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, was himself a rapist, a multiple rapist. And that sets the moral tone, I think, of that organisation which was advancing on Kobani. Um, this organisation, the Daesh, of course, had committed genocide in Shengal or Mount Sinjar, the homeland, the heartland of the Yazidi people, another Kurdish-speaking um, people. And at that time, I don't mind admitting, I was sitting on the edge of my seat watching the television thinking, can they hold out at Kobani? They were lightly armed. They were facing a foe who was heavily armed with weapons, heavy weapons that they got from the Iraqi army, sometimes handed over freely, at other times captured. And they had light weapons to repel that attack. So I was sitting on the, the side, on the edge of my seat. And as I said at another meeting the other night, I recalled as I sat there the words of Albert Camus, the great French writer, when he was sorrowing over the defeat which actually did happen where a fascist regime was installed and that was Spain in 1939 and he said we learnt that one can be right and yet be beaten, that force can vanquish, vanquish spirit, that there are times when courage is not enough. As I say the defenders were lightly armed and you, if you think back to that time and you recall the TV images along the border with Turkey, which was close by to the city of Kobani, of course, there were tanks lined up, Turkish tanks. And naive people thought, maybe the tanks will come to the defence of the <coughs> defenders of Kobani. Not a chance. The leader of Turkey, the president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, is on record as saying that he hoped that Kobani would fall. And not only that, but the Turkish state stands with blood on its hands for aiding and abetting Daesh in that region. MIT, the Turkish military intelligence, was hand in glove with them, perhaps from the very start. So that was the situation. It looked desperate. It was desperate. Would another variety of fascism triumph in Kobani? And yet, seemingly like a miracle, the defenders tenaciously held on. And if you think about it, that slogan must have been reverberating in their ears. Sure, they were defending their community, but also what they were doing, they were fighting for women, life and freedom against an enemy which had no time for any of those things, which regarded women as chattels to be used for whatever purpose men thought they were what they should be used for. Um, life, they had no regard for life. They were mass murderers. This was genocide that they were involved in. And of course, freedom, freedom, no freedom. People were to be converted at the po point of a sword or a bayonet to their twisted version of Islam, or they would die. And yet, yes, we learned that they were right and yet they weren't beaten. In this instance, force wasn't, didn't vanquish spirit, and courage was rewarded. The United States, to its credit, realised that here was a force which was capable of standing up to this barbarous enemy, this barbarous enemy of all humanity, um, which, had it succeeded, would have set up a regime that makes the Taliban regime in Afghanistan looked like, a, looked like a, a picnic or a Sunday school. 
the United States began to drop weapons, mainly light weapons, and also, of course, to, they engaged on airstrikes on, on, the, on, the, on the Daesh fighters. IS was put to flight, so much so that on the 17th of March 2017, the Syrian de Democratic Forces, with the Kurdish fighters as the core of that army, which advanced on Raqqa, the caliphate, the, cap or the, the um, so-called capital of the so-called caliphate, that fell on the 17th of March 2017. These victories were victories for all of humanity, but we should never forget that they came at an enormous cost for the Kurdish people. Tens of thousands of their best young people, their finest young men and women, died or were maimed in that struggle. And that struggle was waged on behalf of all of us. We often talk about turning points. It's, it's something of a cliche, but Kobani was a genuine turning point in the struggle against ISIS. Had those um, defenders not held out, who knows what would have happened, what the, the future would have looked like. As I say, think of the Taliban in Afghanistan and multiply that several times and you would begin to get some idea. Alas, what has happened since then, I just sometimes can't get my mind around the ingratitude of the world. It started with Donald Trump, who withdrew most of the American troops and this signalled to President um, Erdogan in Turkey that he could get ready to invade. And I don't know if you remember his ridiculous words when some of his generals said, we can't do this. And he said, Kurds never helped us at, um, on D-Day. Um, I don't know what goes on in that man's mind, but that is the level of ingratitude and stupidity that the Kurds have had to, to put up with. Um, it allowed the Turkish army, aided by jihadi proxies, some of which were, of, of whom were, I should say, recycled Daesh fighters, to invade the westernmost canton of Rojava as the, the uh, uh, autonomous administration area in, in north and northeast Syria. It enabled them to invade Afrin, the westernmost canton. This flouted international law and the world turned away, turned its vision away from it. There were war crimes committed on a colossal scale. There was ethnic cleansing, which is specifically a crime against humanity recognised by the United Nations. And since that time, when Afrin fell and the population was expelled in what we could call ethnic cleansing, there have been countless cross-border attacks drone and artillery strikes, and there is credible evidence of the use of chemical weapons against Kurdish guerrillas by the Turkish military. Um, and we should also think, where does Erdogan get his um, tanks from? He gets them from Germany. Where does he get his military aviation from? He gets it from the United States. He gets it from Britain. And something which I would like to see followed up in Australia is that there is a British subsidiary here which provides high-tech weaponry, high-tech components which are used in drones, which are used against not only the Kurdish people but other peoples in the Middle East. And that's something which is a total disgrace and the Australian government should get onto straight away. Um, unfortunately, because... The, he's got away with it this, this far. The world has turned it, its, its back. Mr Erdogan is plotting an even greater invasion of, of, of Rojava. And it makes me think of the image that springs to mind, perhaps, is of a people, someone walking on a tightrope and there's a raging sea below it full of sharp rocks, sharks and all sorts of other creatures. And that is the, the peril which the Kurdish people are facing today in Rojava. Um, they are faced by Assad on one side, the dictator of Syria, and on the other side they have another dictator. Um, they have the, the dictator called Erdogan in Turkey. So this is a massive tragedy. We cannot allow it to happen. And it makes me think 
of the slogan or the motto of my first trade union, 50 odd more years than I care to think back, and that was educate, agitate and organise. And I think that we can all do those things. We can educate ourselves. We can find out what actually has happened to the Kurdish people, the whole history of the Kurdish people over the last 100 years. Um, we educate ourselves, then we can educate other people and we can agitate, we can set, write letters to newspapers, we can speak up in parliaments, we can speak up in our church groups, we can speak up in trade unions, whatever avenues that we live and work in and we can organise to stop this. And specifically, I would mention a couple of things which I think we should start to ask the Australian government to do. And one is to support a no-fly zone in the north of Rojava, along the border with Turkey, to call on the United Nations to implement a no-fly zone to stop Erdogan's tax. Um, secondly, something which has been in the news very much recently, we should repatriate all the Australian ISIS families. We can't expect the Kurds to clean up our mess. They simply don't have the legal, welfare or other means to do that in those camps. We should provide material aid to rebuild the destroyed infrastructure and cities. And we should protest in the United Nations. Every time there is some atrocity, we should protest. And we should ponder, I'll finish here, I hope I haven't gone over time, um, we should ponder the deceptively simple yet profound message that the Kurds are telling us. The battle cry of Jin, Jihad, Jihad Azadi, that is women, life and freedom. Thank you.